Now let's take our, our Markdown document and make it interactive. So I'm actually not going to do this line by line in the code. I've already made the changes, but I'm going to start with this R Markdown document, flip over to the interactive version of this, and show you each of the changes that I've made. So notice in the header here that you see output an HTML document. I've got TOC colon true, which renders a table of contents at the beginning. And then I've got TOC float colon true, which makes that table of contents floating. In order to make this content interactive, the first thing I need to do is add a line at the top of, at the bottom of the header that says runtime colon shiny. And notice that there's no tab before that because runtime colon shiny isn't modifying the HTML document or the output. It's actually modifying this whole document. So it's at the same level of tab as the title and the output. In other words, there's no tab before the word runtime. Okay. So scrolling down, the next change that you'll notice in this first code chunk is that I've highlighted or I've added the packages Shiny and Arlang uh, to be libraried in after library tidyverse. The Shiny package makes sure that I have access to the functions like select input and render plot. The Arlang package gives me access to the uh, parse expression function, which I'll use further below. And notice that I've still got this include equals false code option uh, or code chunk option selected here, which makes sure that when I go to render this, neither the code nor the output gets shown, but they, the code does get run. So that this, uh, you know, this data does get loaded. Okay. Now let's scroll down and look at um, how we've taken some of these questions and made them interactive. The first question here um, is an example that uh, was also in the lecture slides, which was we wanted to add a select input that let folks uh, look at the mean blood pressure for individuals with and without diabetes, but also with and without CHF or congestive heart failure. And similarly, we wanted folks to be able to look at the analysis uh, for everyone and also restrict it to only those individuals who are greater than 65. So if you were to do this non-interactively, you would have had to show a separate plot for every single one of those situations and to prepare that separate plot ahead of time. So in order to make this interactive, the first thing we did was um, add our select input. Uh, notice that the variable name for the first argument is in quotes. So that first select input, the variable name is diagnosis. The label is just what you're going to show the user. The, what is the question that this select input is trying to answer? And the, the choices are the answer choices. And since the first option here is diabetes, that will be the default option. Um, and they'll have to click it to select CHF. And for that second select input, the first option is true. Um, and that second option uh, is age greater than 65. So now that we've got the values of those inputs, how do we want to show the actual answer? If you remember what we did um, when we were answering this question in the non-interactive form, we started with left join patients comma PMH. Then we grouped by diabetes and we summarized SBP equals mean SBP and uh, disregard the missing values. To do this interactively is fairly similar. The first step is still left join patients comma PMH. And then in this case, I added an age filter. Um, now I could have physically in this filter section written in the words true, and this would have filtered everyone in. So basically the filter is not doing anything. Similarly, I could have written in age greater than 65. But unfortunately, I don't ha you know, have the ability to write this in interactively when someone selects something, because I don't have time to you know, sit on a computer and be uh, you know, responding to the commands of the user um, every time they change their input. Unfortunately, what I have access to is the value true in quotes. When someone selects that age filter of true, what I actually have get back is true in quotes. Or if they select age greater than 65, what I actually get in 
to the filter function here would be the equivalent of typing out age greater than 65 in quotes. That won't work in R because R expects me to have typed out age greater than 65 without the quotes. So like this would work, but putting that in quotes would not. So if I were to try to make this piece of code work with age greater than 65, the way I would do this is the two exclamation points, the parse expression function, wrap that piece of text, and now this would work. However, it wouldn't be linked to my input, uh, like the way I have that select input to select those two options. So the main change I need to make here is, instead of hard coding in age greater than 65 in quotes, I'll refer to that age filter uh, variable using input dollar sign age filter. Notice again that age filter when I use the select input was in quotes, but when I refer to it inside of the filter function um, in my you know analysis, it is preceded by input dollar sign because it's a variable that lives inside of the input object. An input is not something you created. It's something that Shiny creates, uh, that runtime of Shiny. And this is how information goes between the inputs and the outputs. Very similarly down here, when I say group by, I, you know, I had diabetes physically typed in, in lab five. But here I'm using parse expression input dollar sign diagnosis. Um, and that's how I'm accessing that value of, di of diabetes in quotes and removing the quotes around it by parsing it. And then remember that because I'm dealing with input objects here, I've got to wrap this inside of one of the render functions. And since the output is a data frame um, or a, a tibble from this uh, left join, I use the render table function, which is specific to displaying data frames. So notice that I have a curly brace to start with and a curly brace to end with here. Um, which lets me uh, add you know, multiple lines of code uh, in order to actually get to the final step of my uh, data frame that I want to actually go ahead and render. OK. And notice that I have echo equals false because I don't want any of my code to show up. I just want my output to show up. Uh, I do want the inputs to show up, but those are not, uh, I don't want the actual physical line of code select input to be visible to the end user, just the input box created by that. OK. Similarly, for question two, I'd asked you to select the top five reasons for men and women uh, and why they visit the doctor. Um, and before, um, I had had, you know, there's actually a, a, a couple of ways that you could do this. Um, the way I chose to do it here was to add a slider input so that you could view the top five reasons, or if you wanted to, you could view the top one reason or just the top, you know, the top 10 reasons. So similarly, as I did before, start with patients, then group by sex and visit reason, count up all the unique combinations of sex and visit reason using summarize n equals n, arrange in descending order so that I get all the visit the visit reasons go to the top. Um, and then I group by just sex. Um, and I slice out, let's say, you know, I, I would have done one colon five here in lab five to slice out the top five reasons for men and for women. So the only thing I have to do here to make this interactive is add a slider input where I give people the option to select all the numbers between one and 10. I specify a min of one, a max of 10, a step of one, which just says, you know, you can select every whole number, one, two, three, four, five, between one and 10. And I'll set the default value to five. Notice here that I only gave it one default value. So you're not going to be selecting a range. You're actually just going to be selecting a single number. Because we're selecting a single number, we're able to just use input dollar sign, the name of that uh, slider variable, which is rows to show, and I'm able to do this, you know, interactively, um, 
uh, without having to parse it. The reason I don't have to parse it is the value five does not have the name of a variable in it anywhere. So there's nothing to parse. I can just directly access that value. So one of the rules of thumb I gave were if you're using a select input, make sure to parse your input when you actually analyze it. If you're using a slider input, there's usually no need to parse it. And so this generally holds true here uh, as well. So ignore that commented line of code. That commented line of code corresponds to the text input that I also have commented out above. Feel free to comment out the slider input um, and play with the text input uh, if you like. But I won't walk through the text input here. And notice that you had to wrap this uh, analytic stuff here inside of render table. Okay. We'll skip over question three. We'll skip over question four and five, and we'll go to question six. And so this is the exact same example I showed from class. Um, but if we wanted to show a select input, slider input, and a checkbox input, this is how we would do it. The one key thing to notice here is that in the slider input, here I gave it two values, zero and 100. So if you give it two values, you tell it that you're using this to select a range between zero and 100. Um, and the default range in this case will be zero to 100. But I could have set this to like 40 to 50 if I wanted to. Um, and I you know, set the step of 10, but that was an option. Um, I didn't have to. I could have made it so that you can select the values like 99 or you know, 34, for example. So again, anything that's in my select input, like yvar here, has to be parsed. Anything in uh, the slider input, I can just throw it in here. The bracket one helps me select the first value of the age range, the left side value. And the bracket two helps me select the second value, which is that right side of the slider input. And then I stored this ggplot, which is what comes out when you run this code into the variable name age plot. And then I said, you know, if the line is checked to show a smooth line, then I want you to display age plot plus geom smooth. If it's not checked, just display the age plot. Um, and again, I don't expect you to use a checkbox input. This is just showing you how you would, um, if you kind of understand how this is working and want to play with that. In many programming languages, you're expected to surround the thing that you want to uh, display with, you know, either like a print or like a you know like a return function here. Um, that's not required uh, in R. R assumes that if you're just typing something out, that's the thing that you want it to display, the very last thing that was typed out. So the very last thing that was typed out here was hplot plus smooth. If that condition was false, the very last thing to get typed out was hplot. So that's actually what will get plotted. If you were to draw a second plot here, it would override this first plot and you'd only see the second plot. For this last plot, um, you could, I just showed you that you know you can, if you want, you can map all the axes of a plot to variables that you collect through select input. And so we were looking at the proportion of people with depression amongst those with and without diabetes. So the same, the you know, initial part of our code is the same: PMH uh, mutate and make this um, a name it instead of having it be a one zero variable. The only thing that changes here is that inside of our ggplot, when we specify our uh, aesthetics, we do x equals parse expression input dollar sign x mapping, and then fill equals you know, parse expression input dollar sign fill mapping, which are the names we got from these uh, quoted uh, sections of the input. And then we just draw our geom bar position equals fill the same way we did before. So now that we've got all this, Let's try to actually run this. Let me make sure my preview is set to no preview. Good. Um, and now that that's set, I'm going to hit run. And it looks like it's running properly. So now I'm going to select this, copy it. And I'm actually going to paste this 
into a browser and hit enter. And you'll see a little thing pop up here that says that um, things are loading. So it says, please wait. And that's the R markdown that's running. So if you look at this, it looks a lot like what we had before with our kind of regular R markdown document, except the thing that changed is that now we've got these inputs here that we can play with. So if I select this and I select CHF, this information updates automatically. If I change my age filter, those numbers also automatically change. So anytime I change either of these two values, this render table function re-renders the data frame uh, kind of automatically. So this is why it's important to specify this part of my R Markdown document inside of render table is because this section is always listening to my for changes in these inputs. And if any of these inputs changes, it knows to immediately try to update the output here. Similarly down here, if I wanted to show the top five uh, visits, you know, reasons for visits, I could do it this way. If I only wanted to show the top one for male and females, I could take this slider and drag it all the way to the left and I get the top reason. If I drag it all the way to the right, I get the top 10 reasons for each. Um, and so where I would have said slice one colon five, I'm now saying slice one colon uh, input dollar sign rows to show. And that rows to show is coming from this slider input. Let me scroll down further, skip over these questions, and let's take a look at this ggplot. So if I wanted to show height, or sorry, uh, weight on the y-axis instead of height, I can click the select input, change it to weight. And this ggplot will redraw. That redraw is happening courtesy of the render plot function. And if I want to change the age range, um, you know, I can drag this, let's say, to 50. And now it's showing only those people between age 0 and 50. Because I specified two values for the slider here instead of one, notice that I have two things I can slide. So now I can say, show me only those individuals between the ages of 40 and 50. Uh, and I'll get that as well. So let me just show the full range. Um, and I can say, you know, let's look at the smooth line. And so that when I click that, remember that it's redrawing that whole thing, looking at that if function. And because that's now true, the, the line gets drawn. But if I were to change it to height, the line still stays because all that code inside of my render plot is being redrawn. So this is what makes Shiny really powerful, is that you don't have to check all these different conditions. All you have to do is specify your inputs, give those inputs variable names inside of quotes, and then inside of your render functions, you can access all the values of those uh, input variables. Finally, let's go down and take a look at that last question. So here we have diabetes on the x-axis, and we've got depression as the fill variable. And they look pretty similar, the proportions. Although, I mean, I can see how, um, you know, they're, they're not exactly the same, but they're fairly similar. Let's say I wanted diabetes to be, um, or rather depression to be both on the x-axis and be the fill variable. I could go here and select depression in the x-axis. And now the only thing being plotted here is depression. And the reason though those bars are different colors is because both the x-axis and the fill axis have been mapped to depression. If I wanted to change the fill to diabetes, now it would basically produce like the inverse of that initial plot I had. So before I had diabetes on the x-axis, fill uh, or depression on the fill axis or on the fill aesthetic, and now I've reversed them such that depression is on the x-axis and uh, diabetes is on, assigned to the fill aesthetic. So that just goes to show you how you can take an R notebook, first make it into an R Markdown document. And then once you've got that R Markdown document, it doesn't really take that much more to make it into an interactive document. The main challenges are learning what are the different inputs you can use and how they work. 
and also knowing how to incorporate them into your analysis. The key question being, when do you use the parse expression and when do you not? And what I'll tell you is, as a rough rule of thumb, when you've got a select input, use parse expression in your analysis. When you've got a slider input, you don't need the uh, parse expression in your analysis.